I want to welcome you from Other Lab, where we are sitting on pipe organ pipes uh, for seats, and we are um, sitting in a shop uh, that is famous for having uh, created many companies. Uh, we had a beautiful tour, and um, now we're going to have a program. The program is uh, Generative AI User Experiences for Aggregated and Curated Knowledge. And it's going to be uh, me in discussion with Peter Norby. Um, this is Peter um, and, and me. And we should probably go for about an hour. And then, uh, you know, if you want to send messages uh, or raise your hand, uh, we have somebody that's going to take notice of those things and um, probably just going to uh, start by by um, uh, talking about um, um, this thing one thing at a time. Uh, this is a um, an abstract that I threw together about our topic. And uh, it's an interesting uh, area where there's an awful lot of people um, doing very, very exciting things now with large language models. And they always, there were lots of people doing uh, gigantic amounts of wonderful things with large language models um, for the last several years. But now everybody's very aware of it because the user experience that was introduced by ChatGTP3 was so extraordinarily different and somehow captured and uh, um, gave people a feeling that they could be part of this experience uh, in a way that no one uh, felt that they uh, had been able to before. So I want to start by asking, what is Generative AI's user interface? And, uh, you know, Peter, you want to take a stab at that? So I think the key is really uh, getting out of the way and uh, allowing people to uh, converse in any way they want to and uh, sort of getting away from the idea that there's a limited number of things you can do. Right. And so we've seen several types of uh, of uh, interfaces. Neil Stevenson said uh, in the beginning there was a command line and you could only be facile with that if you memorized all the commands. Uh, and then we decided that's uh, good for some people, but for others it's not so good because they can't memorize all the commands and they're not facile with it. So we said let's take all the commands and put them up in the menu bar and you can click on them and see what the commands are, at least what their names are. Uh, and that means uh, there are affordances you could explore and you could figure out what to do, even if you hadn't memorized things ahead of time. Uh, but you still, you could only do the things that the designer of the system expected you to do. And you could put them together in creative ways, but you were limited in what you could do. And now, for the first time, we have an interface where you say, you can do almost anything. Uh, now, the problem is it doesn't always work. And sometimes it lies, sometimes it goes off in the wrong direction, but there is this feeling that it's completely open-ended. And that's the first in terms of computer interfaces. Well, I think that, you know, you take uh, uh, Eliza in 1965 or something, and it it actually could could right. answer anything as well. Um, <laughs> right, but, the, but you, you soon got tired of it and you soon begin to see behind the curtain and say, oh, well, it's just filling in the blanks. Right, so with Eliza, it was really a mirror and anything you said, you noticed. Mm -hmm. And what this seems to be is more like a mirror of everything that has been digested by- By, by oh, anybody. Oh, by anybody. Yeah. And, uh, that 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 really gives a very different response characteristic, but there's there's more. I mean, somehow what it's doing when you say something is very different from any Eliza. It's not keywords. It's mm -hmm. not. It's it's a lot of other things going on. And maybe we'll move to the next question and talk about that. So why does generative AI feel natural? and the text, and together the two of them come up with an understanding and a lot's going on in that person's head and maybe not so much in the text itself. And I think what everyone has been surprised at the last couple of years is saying, well, maybe there's a lot more in the text than we thought. And uh, you don't have to be that clever in the reader's head. 
And there's more going on there, more about the world is actually portrayed in the text itself. So I think that was a, a surprise to, uh, certainly to me, and, and I think to most people as well. And then the other thing that I found really surprising is, you know, I thought it would take us longer to get to a system that can do so many disparate tasks so well. But I also thought that any system that can do all that wouldn't make as many mistakes as the current systems do. So I'm surprised that you can be so good and yet still be so bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all surprised. I, I think that when I talk to you or anybody else, uh, the number is a third of the things that people say aren't true. <laughs> and and so that that you know who knows where that number yeah. comes from or how reliable it is. but but what's what I think we're so used to with computers is that we're used to them as databases and we're used to them as precise. And so when it comes back and it's tying islands of facts together with some story that makes it feel continuous, I think that makes it feel natural. Mm -hmm. The naturalness has to do with that continuity and story. Story seems to be very critical to people understanding. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the both story understanding, we go back to Roger Schenck, always believed the story understanding was so important and many, many other people. But also uh, this business of both that the what you're telling it is a story and what it's telling you is a story um, is intriguing. And what I kind of wanted to... Um, to, to, to fiddle with here is this problem that while it is a story and it makes sense relative to how people normally communicate, quite frankly, we are Im somehow embarrassed by its mistakes and surprised by them and confused by them. When why is it that we aren't when we talk to some random guy trying to get money from us on the street? Yeah, because yeah, I think they're just different types of mistakes. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, they don't make the same mistakes that we did. And, the, and if they did, then we'd have a very different outlook at it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I guess there's some remnants of still not knowing how to interact with these things that we've, we've been so used to saying, yeah, I know what a computer does, right? It's got some algorithms, you can do some things, you can execute some commands, and it's going to follow step by step and do very specific things. And if there's anything outside of that, it's not going to be able to do it at all. And now this has broken that paradigm and said uh, it can kind of do anything, but you don't know where the boundaries are. You know, when I talk to somebody that went to Harvard, they're going to bring up the fact that they went to Harvard in the next three minutes. <laughs> you just know it, right? Mm -hmm. And if I know, if I'm talking to somebody that's hungry, they're going to talk about being hungry in the next three mm -hmm. minutes. But if I ask somebody that's hungry to work out an equation, somehow they're going to explain to me that they aren't going to fucking fill out an equation right now. And somehow we kind of expect that and we have a model of them. And why? How? what would we imagine doing so that we under, had more of a model that the specifics uh, of, of some weird part on a car that is for only one part, one car. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get from from this generative AI system because it's it's kind of general knowledge, um, and not be so surprised. I guess part of it is uh, it doesn't come from one place; it comes from everywhere, right? And so, as you talk with people, you kind of get a feeling for the kinds of things they're likely to know and not know, and you don't expect them to know everything. Uh, but these large language models, they're large, and they remember everything, uh, and that's different. Uh, and I think that's, in part, that's a real weakness, that they try to remember thing, everything rather than look it up, right? So, you know, if I uh, ask a person on the street, uh, what's the capital of France, they're probably going to be able to come up with Paris. Uh, but if I went through every country and every county and every country and asked the capital of that, uh, they're not going to know most of them. No, they but, aren't. But for the large language models, it's like, yeah, sure, I know all of them. <laughs> right. Right. They right. were mentioned. So I remember those just as well as I remember Paris. Uh, and that's kind of weird. And so right. we don't know how to uh, how to react to that. Right. I guess I, 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 like, I love that because what you're kind of saying is you walk up to somebody that acts like they know everything. 
And then you kind of are, are discouraged when it turns out that it's kind of a facade. Yeah. And actually, they don't know anything specific. I mean, mm -hmm. I think of the specific things as the problem. Um, and so but, but, uh, I want to say that there was a turning point for me where, where I really saw the difference between uh, an AI program and a traditional program. And this was like a decade ago before we had large language models. And I get alert on my phone and it says, time to return rental car to Logan Airport. And I said, oh, this is awesome. You know, somebody parsed my email from Hertz, put it into my calendar, um, gave me an alert when that calendar event was exactly at the right time and, and put a really helpful map up on my phone. So everything was awesome. And then it said, time of travel, 20 minutes by bicycle. And I said, well, it did basically everything right, but that's not very good. And so uh, this is a Google product. So I go to file a bug report and I said, and there's a little drop down that says, who do you assign this to? And I said, everybody did their job just right. All those things that I just mentioned, they did what they were supposed to do. And nobody's job was to say, read and understand the title of the event. It was just display the event, right? And so, you know, I could file a bug saying you should fix this and in case the, uh, the event is exactly return rental car, you shouldn't recommend going by bicycle, which by the way, was a good recommendation because I do commute 20 minutes by bicycle quite often. Um, but if I said you have to fix that, then I would also say there's a million other things at that same level that you would also have to fix. And that just doesn't make sense for traditional software. So the only possible response, if I had filed a bug report to say, it's behaving as intended, that that's right. not something that you can fix in this right. kind of a system. So, but with an AI system, you can say, yeah, I expected to get that right. And up until last month, uh, all the AI systems got it wrong because they'd all been fine-tuned on safety and they all said, oh, well, whether you should go by bike depends on many factors, weather <laughs> and the traffic and so on. Uh, finally, last month, I got barred to just say, no, not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, interpreting all that as when we're talking to the, the beggar on the street or the or the smart guy that we're going to ask a question. We've got context. We know we have a model of what they're like that is really hard to duplicate with the AI. And that context thing is going to be with us as a problem for a long, long time. Yeah. So, you know, on some, some level, I think what we're driving towards is it'll be perfect when we have everything. And it reminds me of the whole business with speech reco, where they didn't want to make new user interfaces for speech record because we're at 99 percent and so what if ever you know or 90 90 percent so one out of 10 10 words is wrong oh well we'll get to 99 percent it'll be perfect but everything is breaks and so i guess i want to know do we we have a choice do we want the knowledge base for generative ai to be everything and that means everything that's curated and everything that's known and then everything will be perfect, or will that also be problematic? Yeah, so, so I think speech recognition is a, a good analogy. And, uh, you know, so I have some history with that. And you're certainly right that if it's getting one out of 10 words wrong, that's terrible. and It's not very usable. Uh, and you can't just ignore that. But if it gets to one out of 100 words wrong, then you can't. And I think we saw in the last few years a threshold that you know, speech recognition used to be uh, a, uh, a big investment. You had to train on your own personal voice and put in a lot of time in order to make it be worthwhile. And only a small number of people did that to something that basically everybody can use. Uh, and that didn't come from some huge theoretical breakthrough. There certainly were great work that was done. It mostly came from improving a couple percent every year and eventually you pass this special. And so I think that's what we'll see with these large language models, yeah. that they'll get a little bit better and a little bit better and they'll have their quirks, but eventually you'll start working around the quirks and just accepting it as is good enough. Yeah, I think I, think I, I want to disagree with you um, in that I think that there is that, but that the user experience design 
um, requires both the computer and the person to absorb what kind of mistakes to expect of themselves and of the system, mm -hmm. or else, regardless of how often it happens, you're going to find yourself driving into a, the side of a, a semi truck that happens to be white. Um, the, the 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 anomalies, the, the the black cats, if you will, come up, and I think that user interface design, being at Kai, I, I especially am saying that, mm -hmm. um, are are critical uh, to to my view of what we have to work on, as well as what you, the AI community, um, finds themselves focused on. Yeah, I think that's right. And and so I'm counting that as part of my little bit of improvement every year. Yeah. Is getting that part better as well. And that's, that can be more important than just sort of the raw accuracy. Well, we think it's very important here at Kai. Mm -hmm. um, to socially respond, uh, systems they're social in character is that a surprising new interface that changes how we receive it and how we decide to engage or even um, accept it uh, into our lives do you think that was part of the issue I think there there is a difference right so so I had some experience working in search and and there you know we sort of felt like well we're offering up answers but that we're saying these are the best answers we can come up with, but we're not really vouching for them. And we're saying, you know, it's kind of it's still up to the user to read, click on that link, read that page, and decide if it's any good or not. So we kind of had an out in terms of the social responsibility and so on. I think there was a huge change when we went from desktop to mobile uh, because of the screen size. Right. So on desktop, if you get a good result in any of the top 10 links, you feel pretty good that, uh, you know, there's a good chance the user will see that and click on that one and, and get their answer. On mobile, it doesn't work like that. You got to get it in the top one or two or else it's off the screen and, and they don't scroll the screen. Yeah. Uh, so there was a, a big push there. And now I think it's even more so because now... It's not going to be one of the top two, one or two or three. It's got to be you're given one answer and you better get it right. And there's sort of more authority behind it. It's not just I'm recommending these links. It's like I'm having a conversation with you and I'm telling you that this is the case. Right, which is which is amazing that we can be that authoritative and, mm -hmm. and convincing that people actually take it seriously. So one of the things that happened to one of my friends is, you know, he was he was pointing out that you know, we'd been fighting with these search engines to get the worldwide rate down to like 20 milliseconds or something. And, you know, every every bit that we got that to respond faster, people were like cheering and loving it. And now, you know, with Vizsla, when this friend of mine was making a video, he spent two minutes concocting his prompt. You know, <laughs> I, I wanted to... I wanted to have a little introduction and then a teaser, and then I wanted to go to the content, and then I want to have it to the conclusion. And I want it to be thirty-eight and seconds long, and or thirty seconds long. And and guess what? It screwed up and made it thirty-eight seconds long. This video it made, but what shocked me and him about it is first of all that he was willing and interested in spending two minutes mm -hmm. thinking through the problem without any interaction with the computer to get the prompt right before he ever started, and then when it came back. He played it happily waiting for it to spend a minute making this video because mm -hmm. computers are slow these days, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then watching this 40 second video and then concocting a prompt to improve it. Why are we willing to take this social time in our communications now when we weren't in search? So I think, uh, you know, we're probably pretty good at being rational with our time and saying, what we're trying to do is optimize uh, the answer. And there's one mode where it says, I want that 20 millisecond response and I want to have a lot of interactions back and forth and one doesn't work. I'm going to come up with another one right away. And there's another mode that says, let's sit back and be a little bit more quiet and let's try to get it right the first time. And depending on what tools you have and, and what their capabilities are, either one of those strategies can be a good one. And in this case, you know, you, uh, your friend seemed to feel like that was the right strategy. But what I love about it, especially, is 
that we've gotten to this hyperactive mode with with our with our search processes, where we click, 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 click. You know, and with the, the amount of time people spend between clicks is gets to be a rhythm, mm -hmm. and it's like you're playing some video game. And I'm just kind of enthralled with the idea that maybe a new scenario makes people reflect more. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think uh, reflection is is good. I think it's you know it's it's not really what we really want. We really want people to be reflecting about the problem. Uh, and if in this case it's reflecting about the tool that I'm using to get to the solution, that's not, that's not really where you want to be spending your time. But it's getting closer, man. Interesting. And no, I totally agree with you. Taking the tool out of the task is what us user interface people pretend we mm -hmm. are doing when we're making better things. I think we've handled this question, or if you okay. want to say anything more about it, uh, how does it impact what we expect of its responses? How does its uh, uh, knowledge impact it? I, I think you've yeah. spoken to that a little yeah. bit already. So we do have a question in the chat. Oh. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, I'll repeat it. Should I use this on everything? No, just, just, just say it. Okay. So a couple of decades ago, I worked at a tech assistant for a big retail company. And they were where I was much impressed by the capabilities and effectiveness of his, of his exec, executive assistant, Audrey. After some thought, I realized that she was a highly specialized transformer who ensured an efficient and cadence match between the VP and the outside world. Sorting and filtering data was essential, but far more important were the connections, links between things, transforming and creating complex structures. How do we create a personalized Audrey for everyone? So let me repeat that, that um, uh, personal assistants have, ha have been very effective when they have deep context and also uh, skills relative to the jobs that, that, they're, that, they're, that they're assistant to. Mm -hmm. And will that, will that um, be something that we um, uh, speak to uh, outside of Kalo or something? Yeah. Kalo was a big research project, a very expensive one geared towards that that task but you want to speak to that I, it's a little off topic what we're talking about no, that's all right it's no i think it's it's right on topic, okay good right because this because this is one of the possible user interfaces okay. that we're thinking about for the future right so you know i said we went from uh, command line to uh, wimp interface uh and maybe this personal assistant is the next step of saying, you know, I don't have to remember any commands anymore. I just ask my assistant to uh, do it for me. And it's understanding what the assistant is good at, uh, uh, you learning the assistant, the assistant learning you, being able to have that conversation and being able to move forward. Certainly a lot of companies that are, are making that path and, and trying to make that happen. Uh, if it works, it'd be great. Uh, there's a lot of issues around uh, privacy and security and, and so on and uh, around trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways, uh, I, I think it could be a really positive step because I feel like now, you know, we're all victims to this uh, war over our attention. Uh, and all these companies are competing for our attention mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and maybe doing things that isn't really optimal for us. But it, uh, if instead of saying, you know, I've got a phone and on the home screen there's 20 icons and I press one and now I've given up complete control over my data, my life, my goals, my attention, everything else to this foreign company. You know, I want some food to show up and I press DoorDash and I want a car to show up and I press Uber or Lyft. And yeah, you know, they've got to serve me well or else I'll stop using them. But I know that they're really out mostly for themselves and only for me secondarily. Uh, and so there's that tension. But if I have a personal assistant that I learned to trust, now I feel like, yeah, this thing's really on my side. And it's going to be the one that's going to go out mm -hmm. and communicate with DoorDash and Uber or whatever, and get food and cars to show up at the right time and do it in the way that I want, not in the way that's profitable yeah. for them. So I, I, I think I have to agree with you totally. And it's there's a couple of things that come to mind. One was um, a friend of mine at Google saying he was jealous 
of the subscription model that OpenAI seemed to be succeeding at yeah. because they were able to do things authentically for the user where Google has to spend a lot of their effort making sure that they're paying their bills by their advertising budget. Mm -hmm. But also it reminds me of the direction that Siri went. Siri came out of that Kalo project and it, it had this command uh, response idea, you know, turn on my lights, uh, get me this data, uh, order me this food. And that um, is something that we've been kind of living with for the last five years, mm -hmm. which is quite different. I presented why I was, was saying what I said earlier, then explain something to me, which is what, what, mm -hmm. we're, what yeah. we're kind of in the mode of doing with generative AI right now. Um, and I, I, yeah. And so that's, that's kind of where I was coming from. And, and yet I bet you they're going to merge. Um, and the question is, what does it mean for us to build all that contest, the context that Audrey had? Because today, these chat GPT systems or whatever, the, 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 the BARD, um, they, they kind of have this limited scope of, of context that they're collecting about you so they don't get completely overwhelmed uh, with maybe with everything uh, that they could be you know, talking about that you've ever talked about. And and how do you think that's going to change that whole context question Yeah, relative to Audrey? Yeah, so that's interesting. And I think, you know, a lot of this is all driven by details of what technology happens to work, right? So uh, the, the T and GPT stands for transformer. And why do we have transformer architecture rather than another architecture? It's because the chips we were using were not a good match for a recurrent neural net, which did one word at a time. It was more important to do multiple words at a time, take advantage of that parallelism. And that's what the transformer architecture is. And so we're always kind of a mixture of what makes sense and you know how do we fit well with the hardware. And so part of the problem right now is we, we arrived at this architecture where we said, well, what seems to make the most sense is to invest a huge amount of capital in building one model uh, and making that work, and then spending a tiny amount uh, fine-tuning that and putting in a very small amount of context, uh, just because for theoretical reasons, that's the, the, been the simplest thing to do. Uh, it's been working pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> and it's been working pretty well. And you know, people like Anthropic are saying, well, we'll go along that path, but we'll just make the context window larger so you can fit more stuff in. And maybe that's the right approach. Or maybe we'll see a change where someone will say, here's a completely different architecture that says, instead of saying you build the model from scratch and then you make small changes to it, maybe we'll have a continuous model that we can uh, update all the time. And so it can take everything into account and you don't have this idea of a context window anymore. And so I don't know if, it, if that's going to happen, but I'm saying we, we arrived at where we are for very specific technical and somewhat arbitrary reasons mm -hmm. for uh, the technology that works. Yeah. So that brings me to the next question, which is about what I, what I say. What, there's a paper I wrote, we can, you, know, you can look up, about the difference between curated knowledge and aggregated knowledge. So... Uh, the LLMs are aggregated knowledge. They bring everything together. Curated knowledge is the web where, or has been the web. Now it's getting to be, people are borrowing from LLMs to put things into it. But it's it's stuff that comes from a specific person, a specific place, a specific study. And and so the difference between those um, is, is, is substantial in terms of what you can use them for in some situations. Not in all situations. Some places they're exactly the same. Mm -hmm. but, it, but the idea of, it being having provenance uh, from somebody that was a physicist when it's about sociology, um, you know, is interesting relative to to it yeah. being, you know, uh, some other provenance. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what we've done in this field and throughout technology ends up uh, uh, having a lot to do with uh, voting and uh, wisdom of the crowd and aggregation and so on. And uh, if you get more votes for this, uh, piling up in the data, then it must be more. Uh, and that's sometimes true, uh, but sometimes not. And sometimes just uh, the one voice that has the right answer is more important than the hundreds uh, that have the wrong answer. Uh, and 
uh, I don't think we, we yet have really good answers for how to do that. I think we are, you know, we had the, the scaling paper that says, uh, as you add more parameters and more data, it gets better. And that, uh, yeah, there must be some point at which that asymptotes out, but we haven't reached it yet. And so people are still trying to rise that uh, scaling curve, but eventually you're gonna get to the point where we're saying adding in more crap isn't gonna help. And maybe adding in quality would be more important than adding in more monitoring. But I guess, I guess quality is completely depends on the topic, right? So mm -hmm. a calculation, of course, is done by a calculator. Um, and uh, results of DNA is done by, by reading, reading data. But, um, you know, other things are done by discussion, um, maybe metaphysical things or, or philosophical mm -hmm. things. Can you imagine us kind of um, being in a position where we kind of know better than to trust facts when we should trust mm -hmm. You know, emotions or emotions where we should touch all uh, uh, trust facts. Uh, yeah, I guess we don't have good ways of measuring that yet. Uh, and yeah, so I guess I would focus more on uh, on giving people choices. Uh, and I do think uh, provenance is really important. Um, you know, so you see a lot of junk on the web and and maybe generative AI will make that worse by being able to generate more junk, or maybe it won't make that much difference uh, because you can generate a lot of, uh, ju of uh, junk really cheaply now anyways, and, and making the cost go to zero maybe is not that much different than making it be epsilon. Uh, so I do see the possibility that uh, we'll move to a world that be more driven by provenance and, you know, maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part that people will be more uh, introspective about that. You know, so if you go back 50 years, we had a world where there were far fewer information sources. Right? So you had three main television networks, you lived in a big city, you had two newspapers, otherwise you only had one newspaper. And you consume that and you sort of knew, well, maybe they have a political slant one way or another, but they're not gonna be just making stuff up because if they did, uh, then they'd be criticized. Uh, but now we have a million information sources and most of them are making stuff up. Uh, and maybe we'll get tired of that and want to go back to this model of saying, you know what, it's not just that it was published and there's some clickbait headline. Maybe I want to depend on who said it and uh, mm -hmm. being able to aggregate. Uh, so I think that's a big deal. And I think it's a big deal from a user interface point of view mm -hmm. that provenance, that means where things came from, um, is, is something that's going to really change the nature of how we consume and what we consume in information and what we think of that information. And I think that <clears throat> exposing that is the field we call security now. Mm -hmm. But I think security's way of looking at provenance is quite myopic. Yeah. I think that we could get to a place where provenance opens up <laughs> a flower of, of ways of knowing how to treat the information from one person, another person, another source, in a way that you can aggregate it, even if you disagree deeply with that source, mm -hmm. you can at least know, I have to know that that source exists, that incorrect source, that fake news, and I'm gonna use that as part of my message creation mm -hmm. for making uh, something that is uh, gonna make a productive, powerful uh, influence. Yeah. I'm sure you have things to say about that, or maybe that's enough. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and uh, you know, I, I hope that we as a public can be better uh, consumers of the news, uh, you know, and that we look back and say, you, you know, there was this period where we, uh, we were starving and then we were faced with this banquet of sources that we just gorged on it. And then we woke up and said, maybe that was the wrong thing to do. 
and we went back to being uh, more careful consumers. Right, so, right. so that's my hope. Trust and source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we make something with generative AI, um, uh, the question is, how do we remind ourselves to bring our own point of view in, or is it not necessary? We don't need to see them as drafts. We can use them as as complete uh, solutions. And, and how do how do we how do we balance there with between you know taking the information and making it our own versus just loving it? Yeah, and so so I'm seeing uh, a lot of that. You know, sit, so sitting in a university, you see all this discussion of uh, teachers saying, uh, well, how am I going to do my assignment? If, uh, you know, I used to just sign an essay and if students wrote a good essay, I thought they were a good student. And now if students wrote a good essay, it meant they typed it into uh, a language model. Uh, and one answer to that is, well, if that's all you were doing, uh, maybe you had the wrong assignment mm -hmm. and maybe you should bring more to the teaching and the, uh, the assessment of, of the students. Uh, and ask them to do more, and, you know. So maybe you don't assign essays at all, or maybe you say, uh, uh, here's an essay topic, and here's what uh, three state-of-the-art language models did. Uh, you better do a lot better than that. And, mm -hmm. and ask the students to, uh, to be critical, and don't just accept uh, the first thing that comes back. Yeah, I think that's a interesting, a really, it's a really interesting area because um, the question of how to make the user experience such that it reminds you to do something lovely like you were talking about, looking at three, given those three essays. And, uh, you know, those are really your, your reference material and um, plagiarize at, 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 your own, at your own danger. And my, my, the story I tell about that is I have a friend that, that um, uses uh, generative AI all the time and to write essays. And uh, her friend does also, and her friend got kicked out of the class, and she didn't. And the reason she didn't is because every time she does it, she makes this essay, then she goes and tries to understand it, then she reworks it into her, her way of thinking about it, and she might ask some other chat, you mm -hmm. know, some, some other generative questions. And so, in fact, that is a research process of her making a creation, as opposed to a uh, uh, absconding with the first uh, thing that that looked like an essay that ran down the street. Yeah. yeah, so so she's taken the right approach and she's learning more, and that's great. I guess a, another criticism I get is is teachers saying, "Oh, but you know, when you learn to write essays, you learn how to think and put together arguments. And if you're not writing the essay yourself anymore, if you're just editing it, uh, maybe that skill will be lost." Uh, and I think there's something to that. And so you, you could come up with ways of saying, uh, you know, now defend your arguments or consider this counter arguments and so on. Uh, but I think you could also say, uh, well, maybe uh, essays aren't the only way to think. Maybe there are other modalities of thinking. Maybe th that can be helped, right? So one of the reasons why we assigned essays is because anybody can do it. You know, the only capital in investment is uh, pencil and paper, uh, and we have other technologies now, but you could do it just a pencil and paper. Whereas we couldn't say, okay, for your next assignment, uh, make a 15-minute uh, movie that expresses this theme. But now maybe you can, yeah. and, you know, overnight, a, a student can make a movie like that, and maybe uh, the modality doesn't have to be the written word. Right. But I, I guess the written word also has an, uh, other other ways of, of interacting from an educational side. I mean, I was in debate team as a child. And and also, you know, you take a look at how, you know, Harvard runs their law school. You know, it's all Socratic and, and people have to show up at class and have these discussions and these mm -hmm. confrontations and interactions with pe with, each, with each other. And I think there's lots of ways of 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 encouraging people to exercise their mm -hmm. their you know way of structuring and analyzing and criticizing knowledge that um can be informed by all the all the examples that we're getting mm -hmm. from our prompts but not um replacing them. Mm -hmm. so um all right uh, what will be the experience of evaluating responses from generate uh from generate where where, where are we going to go with uh, evaluating the responses that come from generative AI. Is it going to stay the way it is? is it, do you see people changing the way that they 
respond or is it, you know, I don't know if there's anything here. I mean, I guess right right now the the main question is, uh, well, did it hallucinate or, uh, you know, should I believe this response or, you know, it, did it make some subtle error or did it make some just completely wrong, ridiculous error? Uh, and, and sure, it's important to be able to do that now. Uh, as the systems get better, that may change. And, and now you have to interact with it in a different way because it's going to be rare for it to be completely wrong. Uh, but you still don't want to say, uh, well, I'm going to accept this as the only possible answer. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm putting up something I don't know whether we need to look at much, but I ran this experiment last summer where, where we kind of made a big list of all sorts of roles that you could have when you're going to go look for information. And what I was surprised by is these are the things that I saw um, web coming back with uh, mm -hmm. all of these kinds of things, scholarly results, yes. Videos that people have made, yes. Um, website results, yes. Sales, marketing, how to. And then this huge list of things that people would love to, to love, love to use it for. People that are doing mm -hmm. fact checking and the scientists and the recreational intellectual um, that were better with the web than with um, the generative AI. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and I, guess, I guess I wonder, is that going to stay or are we going to find that this the, these three that I have for knowledge expert are going to be dominant, um, are, are going to expand to, to, yeah. I mean, are they going to stay, is it going to stay this way that, um, that, that these things that are, that require provenance are going to stay in the world of, of the web or is that going to change? Yeah. So, so I agree with that. And, you know, I've done a similar thing in the, the course I teach where we tell students, here's some tasks. Uh, do it with a language model and, and do it on your own and compare. Uh, and, you know, we did that last year. Most of the tasks were easier doing it on your own. It was hard to get the, the language model or the image models to, to make the thing you, you really wanted. It's like they were good for entertainment and they could come up with the first version. You could say, wow, it's amazing that they could do that at all. But then when you said, now I want to refine it and be exactly the right thing, uh, that was hard to do. And so I think you're right that for a lot of the cross product of these tasks and these sources that the traditional web is, is better at it. And maybe that's not surprising, right? Because it's had 20 years to get that all right, to get that match up. Whereas the language models basically have it at that one year. Yeah. So, you know, give them a chance to, to catch up uh, and then it'll be a more fair fight. Yeah. I mean, I think there's another aspect, which is large language models are about language. Yeah. And um, on some level, language is critical and writing is critical and reading is critical, but that's not the only thing we do on the web yeah. or, or, or online or, or in our lives. Yeah, and, you know, and I know people who say, yeah, when I want to find something out, uh, I go to TikTok and and all those other sources you mentioned, those are for old people, and uh, we don't use those anymore. Right. And then, and now, <laughs> when our friends go to program, they go to generative AI. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't go to, uh, you know, to um, whatever it is. Um, anyway, the, the online uh, support mm -hmm. support things for that. So I think uh, I think that's 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 really um, right, and and it is getting much better. In fact, I. I had to do something, some piece of work this weekend, and I used ChatGPT4, forgive me, mm -hmm. and my friend used ChatGPT3.5, and he was shocked because yeah, it's a big difference. It's a huge difference. And I, I wonder, do you have any feeling for the, the really new tools that are, that are coming online? Uh, we could talk about the ones that came online this week or, or you know, when we get ChatGPT4. Five, and then, of course, you guys have, have uh, Google has has uh, introduced some new things. Do you want to say anything about about the new things that you foresee in the next few? <laughs> These days, it's, it's it's a long ways out if you talk about a month or two. Yeah, but um, uh, you know, I think we built a system that's like uh, uh, a Moore's law uh, race, right? So, when you're making chips, you say, "Okay, um, here's a product. I'm uh, I want to launch it a year from now, so I know how." fast or efficient it has to be because I know what the competition is going to do. And I think we're in a similar place. So yeah, I mean, 
GPT-4 had to be a lot better than 3.5. Google came out with Gemini. That had to be better than 4. Uh, OpenAI is going to come out with 5. They're going to make it better than Gemini, and, and we're going to keep going like that. And I think from a user interface point of view, we're also going to be coming going. And so one thing that came out this week is this um, this this ability to make your own uh, chat, uh, your own generative AI system. And uh, my friend that I was talking to today uh, is working with a professor to write a book with him. And she's been using generative AI for lots of it. And now what she's done is taken his old book, his first book, and dumped it in so that now everything that comes out comes out in his language and she did this and just just turned this around in you know in a in a few hours and so she's absolutely got this oracle that is the person she's trying to write with and for built into her system does yeah. that does that seem uh like an unusual uh, user interface and, or does it seem like only weirdos are going to try that <laughs> what do you think no the tools become available people are going to start doing it and, uh, and, you know, it sounds like your friend is a very facile programmer, so it's right at the cutting edge of what you can do. Uh, and that's great. And I think we'll see a lot of uh, really exciting things from that. I guess I'm more interested in what the more amateur can do. Uh, so I have a friend who's a biologist who said, you know, I, I, I got a PhD in biology. I didn't know anything about computers and I picked up a little bit of programming and I could read from a data file and draw a plot. And he said, but, you know, I studied bird migrations and I always wanted to have like a map of the birds and be able to click on it and zoom and so on. And I knew that was way beyond my programming ability, but then I heard about this co-pilot thing and I started asking it and I built the app and I never would have even tried uh, without that help. And so I think for that kind of you know, sort of amateur or, you know, uh, someone has a lot of expertise in one area, but not in programming skill. This is really opening up a new frontier. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, if you go back, you know, 50 years ago, people tried to make programming languages that were, they were language, right? So COBOL. Yeah. And uh, people said, oh, you can, anyone can program in this or, or hypercard or things. But those were really mechanistic approaches of making a language that makes a problem simple, where this is really fundamentally different than that idea mm -hmm. we, we used to call, you know, solving problems in computer science, making a language that made your problem simple. How would you characterize the difference between this, this new approach to writing programs by having an expert programmer inside of this, this AI? Um, yeah, what, what's that gonna be like? And what's debugging gonna be like? And what's yeah. architecture and design gonna be like? So I think it's different in that you don't have to learn the, the language. You know, we've had languages that are simpler. Python's supposed to be simpler. Hypercard was a great example. Uh, but you still had to learn them and use them. And now it's more like, I'm going to describe my problem, and it's going to spit back some code. And I only have to be, be able to read that to the extent that I can find an obvious bug or something's wrong figure out what's going on, but otherwise I don't even have to look at it. Uh, and so that's really different. Well, I think that is a huge user interface statement that if you can describe the problem and the system can can absorb that and use that as, as, its, as its cue of something to do, it's a very different kind of yeah. language interface and than it, one that I, you have to learn exactly. at all. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what are we gonna do in the future, right? So, you know, we train these systems on existing code, which is in Python or C or Java or whatever. And so it becomes good at that. But uh, all that existing code so far was uh, written by humans. And now if we say, if the dominant mode is going to be this partnership between human and machine, then maybe all those languages are wrong. And instead we want a language that's designed for this communication between person and machine. And we don't have any existing code in that language. Can can you get, I mean, just for fun, it'd be interesting. I, I, I haven't thought about this much. Sorry about the roar in the background. Um, but can you give an example of something that that makes you think of? Uh, or is it just so early that we don't really have anything but just kind of the inkling that that might be true? Yeah. Uh, 
So who knows if it's true? Right? <laughs> it's but, a great, but, it's a fabulous. But, but to me, thought, the interesting yeah. question is, what is that language, what could that be like? Uh, and, you know, we have spent time trying to have languages that are uh, more procedural or, or have less uh, detail and, and so functional. on. So, so maybe something like that. Um, but also, you know, we succeed in programming if we're able to build hierarchical structures. And it feels like we aren't really there yet with uh, this kind of help, right? Because you're still kind of building at the base level and you're not saying, uh, well, now I built these components and then they can combine into higher ones and they can combine into higher ones. Uh, See, I, I kind of, I have a different take on it. I, I think that we want to communicate problems and solutions the way we communicate problems and solutions. And we don't think in terms of, you know, of scoping and, and hierarchy and structure and 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 all of the things that, 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 you know, computer scientists like us think about when we're talking to people. But unless, we, you know, unless we think about, uh, it's not just about the people, it's about the problem we're solving. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like organizing, you know, will it be like organizing my desk, organizing my, you know, you know, setting up my office, setting up a your garden. What what are the ways that we communicate about things that we're trying to structure and organize when we're explaining them yeah. in the world? So I hope it'll be more like uh, organizing a, a team of people, right? To say, you know, I'm trying to do this project, and I've got this team, and I've got some programmers, I got some product managers, I got some UX designers, I got all these uh, different staff. And together, we have to come up with an approach that works and everybody do their thing and have it all work together. I, I love that thought. I think that social communication is, is super interesting. In fact, I was talking to this person trying to redo some of the early, early development stuff, Piaget stuff, um, and realizing that while it takes until you're four years old to put blocks together and understand those, that... Almost instantly, babies understand social structures and they recognize when dad's missing or dad's lost his arm or, or whether, you know, or there's a new person in the room. And I think that um, we have some built in super good ways of thinking about things when we think about mm -hmm. them from a social perspective. And I think that is another statement I want to, I, I'm trying to put little, little stakes in the ground for our user interface community to realize that we have a role to start thinking about these issues because um, we don't, you know, uh, it is a chance to get the nerd, the nerdness out of the nerd activities uh, mm -hmm. as we move uh, towards new things. Now, I do. So this is from Rahiv Bahita. I hope I pronounced that properly. Um, so as a medium, natural language is often prone to ambiguity and imprecision. Are there other user interfaces that allow for more precision and less ambiguity when using large language models? Okay, I think from now on we're going to have to just depend on my microphone. Um, so, because I didn't, did you understand her, her statement? It was too confusing. Can you say it again without your microphone turned on again? Yes. Because we we, we didn't hear it. Maybe other people did. Okay. Um, it's, I guess, now it's fine. Just my voice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... As a medium, natural language is often prone to ambiguity and imprecision. Are there are there other user interfaces that allow for more precision and less ambiguity when using large language models? So, I guess one of the ways I like to think about things is to say. Uh, some of the ambiguity is in the solutions and some of it is in the problem. And uh, I think we get confused with that, right? People Actually, this was asked in the context of communicating with the LLM, not the other way around. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's the problem part. The, so uh, the ambiguity in us stating are what we want the LLM to do? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's a great question, and 
And I guess it follows what I was saying before about uh, let's treat this the way we treat uh, working with a team of, you know, here, I have an assignment for you. I want you to do such and such. Uh, and if I'm a bad boss, I just dictate that and then run off to do something else. Uh, but if I want good results, then I have a little dialogue back and forth saying, uh, what do you think of that? Does that make sense to you? How do you interpret it? Uh, what approach do you think you would take and what, and how would that meet what we're trying to accomplish? So I think it's, uh, I don't think there's a magic unambiguous approach to making the first statement, but I think it's a process of negotiation. Uh, now it certainly is true that we shouldn't, that there is ambiguity in, in English and we shouldn't assume that English will be the only answer, right? So if there's mathematical equations that have less ambiguity, then yeah, use those. If there's, uh, if you can draw some art or uh, make a 2D graph or a 3D graph, uh, then use those as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, whatever medium helps you get that point across so that you can have that communication and come to a mutual understanding. So I, I agree with a lot of this. Uh, I think it's really exciting to recognize we had a command and control model. We used it in Siri and we used it in uh, Google Now is beautiful on your assistant uh, is fat, the best there is. But moving to this generative AI, what I'm shocked by is you people, people will say, you know, I mean, I had this 87 year old, the second week Chat, Chat GPT was up, say, come to me and say, well, I told Chat GPT to tell me the story in the language of Shakespeare in iambic pentameter, and it did it. And I just, mm -hmm. and I realized that, you know, we actually can be quite expressive. And if we uh, have a goal of communication about something, sometimes we throw away some of the ambigu ambiguity and get more directive automatically. But I also want to move to, so I think that, that maybe we're going to not have as much of a problem with the ambiguity as we, as we always have imagined we would, because it's been working quite well this year. But the other thing that Peter said that I really loved um, is this question of mixed, mixed modality communication. And I, um, I love how much gestures and hands and, and facial expressions matter, even though we don't have very crisp ways of um, of, 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 of of making a language out of that that we that we can that we that we write down, and I love the fact that when I've worked on design stuff, as this space is all full of artifacts, the artifacts are part of our communication. That drawing he was talking about, picking up things, putting things together, showing how they they move around each other. Um, you know, you know whether they're going to protect you, whatever they are going to do. And I think that the more we can get to this mixed mixed communication, the simpler it's going to be for people. Um, I don't know if that's too much, but Nikki, is there another question? And it seems yeah. as though they can speak from here. So if they speak, that works for us too. Yeah, um, there are some in the chat, um, but I can also put Well, you can just it. express them yeah. or I could um, bring them up, I guess. So. Should I stop sharing and look at the chat, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, let's get to the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 13. Wow. Although they're probably just all saying bad things about us. <laughs> um, where is my chat? Why can't I go up and down in it? Oh, there they are. Okay. Uh, we can hear them fine. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Uh, do you have one? That sounds fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you do this? Yeah. So this question is twofold. So when ChatGPT 42 comes along, how does it evaluate between radical ideas? And is trust the critical metric of AI usability? Uh, yeah. It's just, so, you, you know, there's all these words that we use, that, and I guess I like trust. Uh, there's other words that I'm skeptical of. Uh, DARPA had a program and the EU has sort of regulations on explainable AI. Uh, and I guess that's something I'm a little skeptical of. And 
Yeah, it's better to have an explanation that than not. Uh, but I think you should also be wary because, you know, every day the stock market goes up or down and there's a supposed expert who has an explanation. But, you know, if it had gone the other way, they would have had a different explanation. So explanations are stories and they're meant to be coherent, uh, but uh, they don't uh, say everything. Uh, and they can be uh, sort of give you overconfidence. Right. Uh, so I want the explanations, but I also want more than that, you know, and I want, uh, uh, you know, a stamp of approval. Uh, you know, so I just joined a uh, AI safety project from uh, Underwriters Laboratory. And I thought they're really interesting because the last time there was a technology that people were worried was going to kill everybody, it was electricity. And Underwriters Laboratory came along as a non-governmental, third-party, nonprofit that says, we're going to put a sticker on your toaster that says it's probably not going to kill you. And consumers trusted that. And because consumer trusted it, it manufacturers said, we're going to submit ourselves to uh, this approval process. Uh, and so I think I'd rather have that sticker than have an explanation. Uh, for, for why the toaster so, is safe. So I think I agree, and yet there's some, some disagreement. UL uh, approves toasters. Now, toasters have electricity right in the place that you're going to put your fork to bring out the, the bread. And they always have, and somehow they still approve that particular object. They're used to approving it. So the question of trust is has to do with other things. We kind of know this about toasters. We also know that if we touch a burner, we're going to get hurt. Um, so uh, I think we got to know, uh, I think we, we, we are, I'm back with, with mm -hmm. Peter saying that maybe trust is too strong a word. And maybe what we need to know is what's an appropriate way to think about this response and where do we think it's coming from? Why do we think it came to us, right? Like I'm saying, Google is doing it for advertising and chat isn't, right? That's that, that's a model I have. It's maybe partially true. So I think that that's that's the question. How do we get people to have, this is a user interface point of view from my uh, issue that I believe in, is to get people to have the appropriate model of the conversation they're having with and the intelligence they're talking to. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have only another... 11 questions. <laughs> Those are all the questions Great. in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's anybody that wants to uh, have a last um, question or two, maybe, maybe somebody that's right in this room has mm -hmm. something they want to say. Sure. Okay, yeah. Michael. Can you get a microphone over there? Oh, I don't think you take that one. You, you give hers. Uh, yeah. Oh, you, you can. Yeah. You can come over here. Come, 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 stand here for me. And and there's another reason. As well, I but I want you here anyway. And that, what I want to say is there's two things I want to do at the moment. One is I want to introduce Michael Neymar, who's about to ask a question, but I want to introduce him for two reasons. One is the question, and the other is this is our speaker for January. And uh, so, so why don't you ask your question, and then later on, if you have a moment, you can even introduce your topic. I can, or I you can, can. try. Um, so I'm interested in um, how this is affecting what we might call human creativity. Uh, and in the visual arts, it's much more apparent than in text because generally the artist community is the, this is an art, this, this is, if the genie knows all of current old knowledge, where does new knowledge come from? Okay. Mm -hmm. But then you start seeing the stuff that's being produced and even, you know, the, the most stalwart artists are going, this is pretty creative. I mean, this is mm -hmm. something. And, and then you can even counter it by saying, what's the difference between that and you or I? Are you being creative? Because all we're doing is taking what's already there. And, and even, you know, at this point, something like randomness comes up. Like, well, you can insert randomness and then get creativity. And, and, and it's not like artists don't do that. <laughs> They've been doing that forever. Right. 
but it really does question where, where does creative where is human creativity come from? Sure, right? sure. Thank you. Well, the I guess I will say something, which is the 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 patent office uh, presents that invention is um, serving a long felt unmet need by the combination of new of known techniques to people uh, in the art, and the fact that it's known to people in the art, those techniques that this, the the new combination of them takes them off the hook of having to be the scientist that's creating the phenomenon. And so it, it really plays into the creativity is quite plausible from, from com combination. You mm -hmm. probably have some more to say though. Yeah. So I remember there's a scene in the movie, I Robot, where uh, Will Smith plays this character is very uh, skeptical of robots. And he asks, you know, can you make a symphony or paint a beautiful painting? And the robot responds, no, can you? <laughs> <laughs> right? and, uh, and, and I think there's something to that, right? So I'm not sure exactly what creativity is, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not gonna die on the hill of saying it's uniquely human uh, and these machines aren't doing it because like you say, it's, it's doing something pretty good. And I guess I would want to get away from those philosophical questions and and say, well, what can we make together, right? So, you know, if I come up with a good prompt and I make something interesting that I couldn't do before, that's great. And in some ways it's enabling people to do something that they couldn't do. Um, I think we saw this before with the art of uh, photography. Right, so it used to be only a small number of very skilled painters could make photorealistic depictions of of reality, and then all of a sudden anybody who could click the shutter could do it, and that changed the world. But we still recognize that there's artistry and creativity in in making photographs. Thank you, but there still is um, this question, and I think this is germane to entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. Um, to spread out and not cluster around the same, you know, I, like... Get I'm stuck, really right, get in a rut. Yeah. Right. And that if you accept the premise that there's a lot to explore, and we can either encourage colleagues and younger people uh, to go out and explore or to compete heavily in, in these narrow little islands. Mm -hmm. And I think the former is really what we want to do more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, it, you know, there is a stereotype that uh, some of what's going on in the valley is just putting these things together in weird ways. It's like, you know, well, my app is like Tinder, but for drones, <laughs> right? And uh, so it didn't take much to come up with that. And maybe the large language model will be better at it than the, so, than the entrepreneurs. I think inventors often delight in the creativity of others and are often curators of, of techniques and they call it their quiver. It's what their back pocket. And what I find so delightful about these new tools is that they just give this ability to feel like you're standing on top of all sorts of possibility. And the creativity, by the way, is always a collaborative activity. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, every piece of creative experience that I've had in my life, if I collab I'm collaborating with a broken bicycle, or I'm collaborating with a, with five friends and sitting trying to solve a problem of how we're getting up the mountain or whatever it is. Um, creative possibility gets greater the more things you can bring to bear on it. And what I love about this generative AI is it kind of it kind of has this focusing thing where it can build a, a precise list that has all these constraints and those constraints drawing from more than ever has been available to anything. Um, except maybe evolution, <laughs> um, which, by the way, is also creative, uh, is is just a miraculous uh, opportunity. Any other questions? Nikki? There's one. Someone has their hand raised. Okay. Jeffrey, Jeffrey okay. Jeffrey, could you speak? Maybe I'll have to speak. Yeah, that's me. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So my, my question is about, uh, I'm interested in, 
the safety of these systems is one uh, concern of mine. And I'm wondering, uh, so one approach that I was wondering whether it would work is can you bias these models by feeding in a very large amount of content with a particular uh, orientation? So for example, if you wanted to encourage uh, nonviolent responses to certain kinds of situations, could you simply feed in, let's say a million copies digitally into the model building process and that that would increase the probability the model would come up with nonviolent type responses? Yes, so you have uh, several places in, in which you can put your finger on the scale. And so choosing the training data is one of them. Uh, it's more powerful to give uh, feedback to, so yes, you could train it with all that data, but then you could also say, uh, here's this problem, how would you solve it? And then you give a positive reward for the nonviolent solution and negative reward for the violent one. Uh, you also have these uh, approaches of uh, constitutional AI, which, which Anthropic is, is really focusing on, where you just say, here's my principles. And it's sort of like you have a preamble to every query that says, always obey the following things, be nonviolent or whatever, uh, and uh, try to, to train the system at that level rather than by individual examples. And so I think all, all three of those are used in conjunction to, to try to tame the systems a little bit better. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think that, 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 that it, there's, there's huge power and danger in that putting your thumb on the scale thing. And we're going to probably see all of that happen, right? Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Oh my gosh. So if that is it, does uh, anybody uh, uh, want to make a last comment? One uh, going once, going twice, uh, and um, and Michael, do you do you want to take thirty seconds to say what you're going to talk about next week, or just put you have to come up here? Okay. Um, you know, I'm sounding like a broken record, but you know, I'm sorry. Uh, just 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 it's we just want a couple of sentences. We don't want so okay. Not so, a lecture, okay. Well, right? So you know the way um, uh, VR virtual travel has almost always been in the top five of everybody's list for home immersion, you know, headset-based stuff. Where is it? You know, what, what's the, the, the problem? What are the opportunities? What are the Where's the beef, right? Where's the beef? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I will be doing a deep dive into that next month. Uh, a lot of show and tell, but also a lot of open forum, because I think there's some very unsolved, interesting design UI, UX questions about what does this mean to have something that's like being somewhere else and what works and what doesn't. And if it helps connect people, it's going to be a good thing. And, you know, global so, consciousness. Yeah. So uh, Michael has uh, been working with cameras behind the camera for, for dozens of years um, and been teaching things like this at uh, universities as well. So it should be a great meeting next uh, next month. Mm -hmm. And it might be at, in in Oakland uh, and it might be here uh, and it must be it might be at SAP or it might be just virtual. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that we will have it in a in a in a physical space. And I'm hoping all of you people online are going to find yourself tantalized by the opportunity to come to interesting places and be with interesting people um, and not just in your uh, desk, uh, your offices uh, once a month with us. So we'll see um, how that goes. And for now, uh, I think that's a wrap for the program for December uh, for Bay Kai. And thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>